G'day and welcome to RACQ's expert panel series on fuel. In the midst of a cost of living crisis, fuel is front of mind for many Queenslanders. But why is it so expensive? Where do we get it from? Why is the price different depending on where we live? These were your questions and to answer them, here's your panel of experts. Dr Ian Jeffries has been RACQ's fuel economist for 13 years and even designed our well-known Fair Fuel Finder app. Andrew Kirk has more than three decades of mechanical experience as an RACQ patrolman. More recently, he shifted gears into research and policy. And our special guest is QUT professor Robert Perrins. Rob brings extensive knowledge of the oil and gas industries. He's also a member of the United Nations Resources and Energy Expert Group. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for all being here today. We got a lot of questions through in our social media for, these, uh, for this panel. So let's go straight there with a question Probably for you, Ian, how can fuel prices fluctuate so wildly? Why is there this price cycle that we don't see with, say, milk or medicine? Yes. Look, so we see a price cycle in the petrol market in all of the larger Australian capital cities and some of the adjoining centres. So in Queensland, we see the cycle in Brisbane, Ipswich, Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast. Look, the cycle most likely started in the 1970s when some retailers started offering cheaper fuel on, on a Tuesday. Tuesday was the slowest day for fuel sales. And then over the subsequent years, that's morphed into the cycle we see today. Looking at the current cycle, it lasts about four to six weeks. On the cheaper days, fuel companies are offering fuel at close to the wholesale price. However, on those more expensive days, fuel the, the fuel price jumps up to about 35 cents per litre higher. Okay, we might just stay with you here, Ian. There's another one on Facebook from David Harvey. Uh, he would like to know who sets the price at the bigger change stations like your Coles and your BPs. So a company like BP, the price at their corporate owned sites would be set by their head office. The BP network also has a, a large number of franchisee sites and at most of those sites, the price would be set by the franchise owner. Coles Express is a bit different because it's currently owned by the company Viva Energy and Viva Energy would set the price across the Coles Express network. Okay, thanks Ian. We might go to Professor Perrins for the next question. How is oil produced and what is the process of turning that into fuel? Well, Tristan, the first thing we got to uh, explain here is that oil and, and natural gas are not something that we create, they're something that uh, Mother Nature creates. Uh, so, and the, the genesis story for this is that basically you've got uh, living matter. So it could, most of it's in the form of, of plants and some of it might be in the form of, of, uh, of animal life too. But basically it dies and then it falls to the, the, the sea floor or to the forest floor or whatever. Uh, and then through geological processes, that stuff gets buried. And over time it kind of gets deeper and deeper into the earth. And then this cooking process starts where it kind of starts to change uh, the nature of that living material. Uh, and so we're left with millions of years later, we're left with this gooey black substance that uh, it's what it is is this, this uh, delightful blend, this cocktail, if you will, of different lakes of hydrocarbon chains. Uh, and so uh, the, the science and engineering that we bring to bear in the oil and gas uh, industry, it's really it's about trying to look into the ground to be able to see where is this stuff hiding. Then we can drill wells into the ground to get it out. Uh, and that, that finding and the getting out part, that's the upstream part of the industry. And next we have the midstream part, and that's the pipelines where we kind of move it to the next part of the value chain. Uh, and we're bringing it to refineries, that's the downstream part. Now refineries, what we're doing there is we're kind of using the fact that those different hydrocarbon chains, uh, that they're different lengths, and they have different boiling points. So we can use the refinery to kind of use the different boiling points to separate the constituent parts of that oil. And we can kind of, uh, you know, take that part and kind of use it for fuel, take that part, use it for lubricants, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of like the, the life cycle of the whole thing. Fascinating. So Rob, how much exactly does it cost to produce a barrel of oil? Well, there's an enormous amount of variability in the answer on that one. So uh, whenever you see the Saudi royal family in the news and they're grinning ear to ear, we're about to understand why that is. Uh, so if you kind of look at onshore Saudi Arabia crude, uh, their production costs per barrel can be as low as like five or six or seven dollars per barrel, which when you think about the going rate for a barrel of oil these days, you know, in the in between 80 and 90 dollars, uh, to be able to make something at $5 and sell it for $85, that's a pretty healthy margin. 
Uh, so that's one end of the scale, as the, the, the Saudi onshore stuff is about as cheap as it gets in the world. And on the other end of the spectrum, we've got uh, parts of the world that are where they have to kind of uh, do a lot more and use more engineering and more science and more capital investment to try to get that oil out of the ground. Consider, for example, uh, deep water in the Gulf of Mexico or, or offshore off of Brazil. Now, those structures that are floating, bobbing around in the ocean there, they can be in up, upwards of three kilometers of water depth just to get to the seafloor, and then you've got to drill significantly down to get, to get the oil after that. So this is like uh, an engineering, uh, this is almost like a magic act. This is incredible what they're able to do there. Now, their production costs, obviously that's not going to be five bucks a barrel to make that happen, but that could be more like 50 or 60 or even $70 a barrel. But those are still profitable ventures when we're making, when you're able to earn upwards of like $85 per barrel to make it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Rob. We also took to the streets to ask Queenslanders if they had any questions for our experts. I'm just wondering what's going to happen to the fuel prices with the, in view of the current crisis in the Middle East. Ian, do you want to kick us off with that one? We did see a spike in the oil price when the hostility started between Hamas and Israel. Over the subsequent weeks, the oil price has eased somewhat. So we are sitting at about a level roughly equivalent to before the uh, attacks in early October. Looking at longer term, it's the conflict in between Russia and the Ukraine is still having an ongoing effect on the price of oil. Look, Russia was one of the top three oil producers. So the removal and the sanctions against Russia has had an ongoing effect on the, on the price of oil. Is there anything else you'd like to add there, Rob? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just want to kind of corroborate what Ian was saying, um, that this is the, the Israel and Hamas conflict. It's not the crisis, it's the other crisis. So the Russia-Ukraine thing, that's, that's kind of uh, probably the biggest disruption to commodities markets that we've seen since the 1970s. Uh, so what we're doing is we're kind of laying on top of that this other, this other issue here. Now, uh, as, and I think Ian already touched on this, is that in and of themselves, there's not a lot of uh, oil and gas production happening in the Israel-Gaza Strip kind of area. Really, the, 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 the question of how much of an impact is this gonna have, uh, it depends on how big this problem grows. And so if it kind of spills outside of its box and it kind of gets worse and bigger, then there may be kind of secondary and tertiary effects here that are a little less obvious. So the World Bank has already done some pretty, uh, kind of done a deep dive analysis of this. And what Ian said is exactly on target. On the surface of it, if everything stays con contained the way that we hope it will, this probably won't make the prices go up more than about 10%. If this expands and grows and kind of climbs out of its box, we could see prices, uh, oil per barrel prices, uh, going up by more than 50%. Some really good insights there. Um, Andrew, we might come to you for the next question. We're getting a lot of uh, questions through on social media about the different types of fuels. People are wondering, you know, between E10, regular unleaded, 98, diesel, premium diesel, what is the difference between them and are we better off filling up with the more premium versions? Yeah, okay, Tristan, well, um, I'll start with petrol. Um, so the three types of uh, petrol that you see in Australia, um, your standard unleaded, which is a 91 octane rating uh, fuel. So the octane rating is how much you can squeeze that fuel before it self ignites. So then we have 95 octane uh, premium and 98 octane premium. Um, so the benefit if your engine is designed to take those higher fuels means that you can have a higher compression ratio in that engine, meaning that you can squeeze that fuel more, you get more out of the explosion, more power out of the engine. So if your vehicle is not designed for those premium fuels, you're pretty much wasting your money. You're better off just staying with the, uh, the regular unleaded. As far as premium diesel goes, uh, there, could, there are some benefits for premium diesels. Uh, the premium uh, diesel has a lot more uh, cleaning additives and uh, algicides and um, dewatering uh, chemicals in there to stop moisture and that building up in the fuel. So there are some benefits. And given that premium diesel is only a couple, uh, two or three cents dearer than the standard diesel, it would definitely be worthwhile going for the premium diesel. But on your petrol car, if it's not designed to run on that higher fuel, just the regular unleaded is fine. Awesome, that's great advice. Um, Dr. Jeffries, we might come back to you. James Stewart on Facebook wants to know, why is diesel often more expensive than unleaded and why does it not fluctuate in price as much? So the price fluctuations are down to sort of the market, the different market conditions between petrol and diesel. 
Look, diesel is still largely the fuel of industry. We are seeing more diesel cars, but still predominantly it's the fuel purchased by industry, whereas petrol is purchased by private individuals. So the market considerations are, are, are different. You know, industry requires fuel pretty much continually, and they have a stable cash flow. Whereas private individuals, we use less fuel, and our money dips in between paychecks. So that's the main difference between why one cycles and, 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 pet and diesel does not cycle. In terms of the current price, the wholesale price of diesel in the Asia Pacific region is higher than the, the wholesale price of petrol, and then that's flowing through to what we see at the Bowsers. The high wholesale prices due to uh, supply and demand considerations in the Asia Pacific region and the wider geopolitical considerations. Russia used to be a large producer of diesel into the international market. Since the sanctions against Russia have reduced that supply somewhat, that's pushed up the diesel price. Also, we see the diesel price very affected greatly by the Chinese economy. When the Chinese economy is growing strongly, they're using a lot of diesel, and then that pushes up the price across the Asia Pacific region. Thanks, Ian. We might take the next question from a member of the public. Um, do you know where Australia gets or sources most of its fuel? Um, Rob, that's probably best for you. Yeah, it's not all great news there. Uh, so if we kind of look back at, you know, about 25 years ago or so, the turn of the millennium kind of time frame, uh, we basically used to kind of, uh, we were much more self-sufficient in terms of oil production and refining capacity. Back around the turn of the millennium, Australia had eight refineries on the go. Uh, we've now got that down to two. Um, and the reason that that shift has happened is that we've seen the, the, the birth of these uh, mega refineries that are, because that industry is really driven uh, by scale, right? So uh, you, you see these refineries happening in places like Singapore and India that are just massive. Um, and we cannot compete on price. It's just, uh, you know, they've just kind of won that game. And as a consequence of that, we've kind of got, like I said, from, down to, from eight down to two, and those two remaining refineries are having an existential crisis because their economics still don't work. So the federal government is kind of shoveling money at them saying, look, for purely strategic reasons, we need you to stay alive. So they're kind of on life support here saying, look, we just need to make sure we have some domestic refining capacity. So how fuel happens in Australia these days is the overwhelming majority of it gets delivered to us as, uh, as finished fuel products. So the, the refining happens in places like Singapore. More than 50% of all the fuel that comes into Australia these days is refined in Singapore, brought here, uh, and then we buy it as that finished product. So you don't think there's any possibility for Australia to go back to the way we were and be self-sufficient for sourcing oil and, and refining fuel? Honestly, I don't see that. Uh, that the, the numbers just don't make that happen. Uh, there's not, even if we could refine all of Australia's oil domestically, uh, there's still not enough oil production happening these days to make that happen. Andrew, look, fuel is so expensive right now for many of us. Um, it's one of the, the front of mind things um, that's leaving our hip pocket every time we fill up. Is there anything we can do as drivers t to save at the Bowser, but also on the road? Yeah, absolutely, Tristan. Um, you know, a lot of people can't afford an electric vehicle, um, but there are other options um, that you've got plug-in hybrid vehicles or just your standard hybrid vehicles. They can reduce your fuel costs. But even without, you know, upgrading your car, there's things that the everyday driver can do. Um, RACQ has developed a eco drive method, uh, which involves um, smooth acceleration. Uh, looking ahead further down the road, you can see that traffic stops. So rather than driving up to that stop traffic and braking, roll off the accelerator earlier and just roll up to the back of that line of cars. Um, smooth cornering, um, carrying less weight in the car, get rid of all those unnecessary extras in the boot. As a patrolman for so many years, doing flat tire jobs and opening the boot, so many people carry all this unnecessary stuff in the boot of their cars. Roof racks, rooftop tents, take those off. It's just wind drag causing more fuel. Maintenance on your car, make sure the tires are correct pressure. Um, make sure that the engine's running properly and it's serviced and efficient. You know, clean air cleaner elements, good clean spark plugs, fuel filters that aren't blocked. All these sorts of things, even down to um, your air conditioner. If it's you're driving around town at low speeds below 80 kilometres an hour and it's not really hot outside, wind the windows down. If you're doing above 80 kilometres an hour, 
yes, definitely use the air conditioner because the air conditioner actually will use less fuel than the wind drag from having the windows down. So there are lots of things that, that people can do to save fuel. And our studies have shown that people could save up to 15% on fuel just by following these eco drive techniques. There's some great tips. Yeah, well, thank you so much for all being here today. And that's all we have time for, for our first of our three-part fuel panel series. And thank you to our members for those great questions. Uh, in our next panels, the need to change fuel tax given the spike in EV ownership. Plus, what is the future of fuel? From hydrogen to algae, what will power our cars of tomorrow? Stay tuned to our social media channels.